You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, since the since the show might uh, might honestly sometimes be called food and faith as opposed to faith and other oddities, um, we did uh, get to sample some food. We didn't sample; we purchased, but we ate some food from a new establishment here in Norman, uh, Press and Plow. Um, yeah, that was awesome. It was a really good a coffee shop, a little bar, um, and then they've got like a, gosh, I always mess up the word charcuterie mm-hmm. boards. Um, we had one of those, uh, you and I were waiting for Mickey to get off work. So we ran over there with the girls. It was um, great. Really good. Uh, nice little selection of spiced almonds, uh, some cold cuts, uh, and some prosciutto, prosciutto and, and chorizo. Yes. And, um, very good. Some dried uh, figs. and Yeah. Go check that out if you're in town. And the blue cheese. Oh my goodness. I need to find out that was exactly. A, yeah, yeah. That was a really was. good blue cheese. Cause normally blue cheese has a funny taste to me that kind of tastes something like toothpaste. And I, I cannot Which, explain it. I don't even understand that. And I'm weird about my food. Yeah. And there's just some quality to it that just kind of hits me wrong with most blue cheese. And I, you know, I, it's, I can eat a blue cheese. Uh, it doesn't, it's not terrible, but but this one was so light and balanced, but it still had a lot of the richness that you mm-hmm. get with most blue cheeses. Um, so amazing, yeah. And they also have a really great nitro cold brew mm-hmm. if you are into that. Um, Starbucks has one too, but this one's a little lighter, I think, a little creamier, and uh, it's it's good stuff. So if you're into coffee and it was a great coffee, excellent cheeses, um, go check out Press and Plow. Yeah, I think that's a good little fun little afternoon get together place. Mm -hmm. I I think that would be perfect for that. Yeah, it's what we did with Mm -hmm. your kids. Yeah, with my kids. Yeah, so they and they they behave themselves. So if we ever get that uh, day on the town uh, level of subscription going, well, we'll just throw that in there. We'll throw in the an afternoon little stop off. We'll go somewhere for lunch. We'll have a little stop off in the afternoon and press and plow. Then we'll go somewhere nice for dinner. See, I like this because I get to go. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of the point. I know. But yeah, it's, yeah, kind of meet and greet for everyone. I- anything that gets me into a, a good eating establishment, mm-hmm. I- I'm poor. So I think this is an excellent uh, perk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of what we've done this weekend. Um, other than that, we've been here recording podcast. Uh, this after is, podcast. This is number after- five for the day. So if we're a little slap happy, we apologize. Um, we we just got done. I don't know if it's going to air before or after this one. We just got done recording a great interview, um, and we will have more information about that on the website. And uh, if it's already aired, we hope you enjoyed it. If it hasn't, we hope you go enjoy it. So um, <laughs> yeah, our schedule is a little iffy at this point. Uh, exactly. But, you know, um, yeah, we've just... we put a lot into this weekend and I was actually talking to another podcasting friend and there he was like you do how many episodes in a weekend yeah nor- normally we do six in a weekend we do three in two days but today has been our, our our we've been kind of pressed for time it's Easter it's Easter weekend so uh yes so we will be uh hopefully we'll make it through this um without too much craziness well not any more than normal I'm making no promises. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I, I say that, of course, then we're going to talk about the Bible. So how can you avoid craziness? Yeah, but that's good crazy. So we're going to try to avoid bad crazy. Right. So, so when we last saw uh, our hero, our hero, I got to stop saying that. It's kind of, although for me, it's like I, a huge Rocky and Bull. I was a huge Rocky and Bullwinkle fan. So that's what I'm thinking of as the narrator on that. Um. <laughs> You can't so go wrong with if Rocky. anyone else out there is a Rocky and Bullwinkle fan. Um, but when we last left the story, uh, Joseph uh, had just gotten taken out of prison, uh, given some new clothes, a new name, a bunch of cool stuff, nice ride and wife. Right. Is that right? Pretty much. That, that kind of summarize it. It's a great summary. And uh, oh, and he's, he's uh, also taken on uh, city planning and some other things. Yeah. And that's going to even become more involved as we go through. 
Uh, I don't think we're going to get to it this this weekend, but um, he's basically in charge of the world's food supply at this point. Sure. I mean, and you've really got to think about this because Egypt's Egypt's crops were dependent on the flooding of the Nile. Mm -hmm. But his family back home, they're experiencing a famine, too, which is dependent on the rains. Right. So this is a massive drought. This Yeah, well, and and I, we kind of talked about that, you know, mm -hmm. Egypt's their their stuff is is dependent on the runoff from all the other places. But this is normally if Egypt had a drought, it wouldn't affect Canaan. If Canaan had a drought, it wouldn't affect Egypt. And so mm -hmm. the the two are not interconnected at all. So this is very much an act of God that is happening to bring them together. Yeah, because yeah, I guess we are talking about two different continents, aren't we? Yeah, we, we are. And I think we kind of forget that if we aren't looking at a map mm -hmm. constantly. And that is, I know I've said this before too, but one of my suggestions, get a good map so that you can at least kind of have an idea of what's going on. And so we pick up in chapter 42, and when Jacob saw the food rations were to be had in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at one another? Now I hear, he went on, that there are rations to be had in Egypt. Go down and procure rations for us and that we may live and not die. So. Well, that's, that's important. I love, you know, putting that let's live and not die. Yeah. It's a well, good part of the plan. It, and it's such a dad move. Why are you still looking at each other? I can right. hear our dad. <laughs> what you got in that, you know? So um, it says 10 of uh, jo Joseph's sons, uh, Joseph's brothers. Sorry, Joseph only has two sons. Ten of Jacob's sons and Joseph's brothers went down to get rations from Egypt. Now, because all ten of them had to go, we think that what was going on is food was being dispensed according to the number of people in the family. Mm -hmm. And so there's an important thing there that all ten of them needed to go to get the most. But I love his reasoning for not sending Benjamin is he feared that he might meet disaster because he keeps Benjamin home. Benjamin's uh, Joseph's full brother. He's the youngest one of the family. Mm -hmm. uh, Jacob is very close to him now that he's lost Joseph. But what he's really saying is you 10 are expendable. Right. You know, I don't care if anything happens to you, but just leave me Benjamin. And well, I, I also kind of wonder too, I mean, I, I get that, you know, I, you guys go, is it, is it you're expendable or you're capable? Because we don't know about Benjamin because for all we know, Benjamin spends all his time with Abraham. Uh, Jacob? Or, yes, Jacob. Sorry. One of the patriarchs. Uh, one of those guys. <laughs> um, yeah, spends all his time with, with Jacob. Yeah, probably. Um, but the, um, and is, he calls him the son of my right hand mm -hmm. and he, he never leaves him. So was it that Jacob needed help or was it that Benjamin uh, needed to be with Jacob? That's a really good question. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump to kind of the answer to that because in, which is no answer at all, really. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, sorry. But in Judah's speech, which we're going to get to um, some of, in Judah's speech to Joseph, he actually says, if you separate Benjamin from my father, he's going to die. Mm-hmm. Who is he? Yeah, it never says which he. Yeah, the, the Hebrew is very ambiguous there. So we don't know if it really is dependent on, on Jacob's depend, survival is dependent on Benjamin or if Benjamin's survival is dependent on Jacob. Mm -hmm. They are so bound together that the two's identity really begins to, to merge and blend when, when for anybody's talking about them. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so yeah, you bring up a good point that, even the best Hebrew scholars have yet to, to pick apart. And so I think that's, that is an interesting thing. Um, now, I think another thing, too, is we need to know this trip took about a week each way. Okay. And so a week of walking, I, this would be like beyond the most epic road trip ever. Well, and I, I wonder, too, because, I mean, we, we know uh, from previous texts that th these people had wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the patriarchs and the sons, we assume, had wealth and land and servants. So the 10 brothers went, but I also wonder, like, how big a caravan did they have people prepared to, to carry back food? 
there's a good possibility, and we we don't know the Bible. Uh, you know, those are kind of non-entities, and you know, you should be you should expect to find people there in the text because supposedly, you know, this text was written for someone who would have been familiar with this culture. Mm-hmm. If we say we went to McDonald's, we're just going to assume there's somebody behind the counter and somebody at the grill, and right, you know, we aren't going to try to go in and and name them all. And I think that's kind of what the the writer's doing here. And so the 10 of them, they go down and Joseph is now second in command. He's dispensing um, the, the provisions. But when he sees his brothers, we all know that they don't recognize him and they shouldn't because all of the reasons you listed at the beginning, he, he looks Egyptian now. Well, yeah. When, when the last time you saw a person... They're uh, 17 years old. They're 17 years old, and you had just uh, accosted them and sold them. Uh, then the next thing you know, you you know, his. We're going to presume that because of, uh, you know, apparently it was in vogue back in the day to be shaven, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ha- shave your head and your face, mm-hmm. uh, versus the the Canaanite way of looking. You know, you're going to have longer hair, probably a beard. Mm-hmm. Um. So it's totally different fashion, totally different dress. And also, where's the, I mean, it's probably the last place they'd expect to find right. someone they had, you know, last seen when they sold them. Well, 17 to 28 is a major time of transition in anybody's physical yeah. appearance. So it makes sense that, I mean, they weren't expecting him. And, you know, sometimes I don't recognize my cousin if I'm going through the grocery store not right. expecting them. Uh, so... It, well, especially it, since he got out of the military. <laughs> yes, yes, because he snuck up on me the other day, and it, he let his hair grow out, and I had no clue it was him. I just had this giant guy hug just me. <laughs> giant bear of a redheaded man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this strange man? So um, I'm having some mic difficulties here. Oh, sorry. It's well, uh, we... wilting. Just tighten it down. Yeah. I... There you go. You got it. Okay. There we go. Yeah, no, I think I got it too high. But anyway, we'll make it work. Just, just look at it when you talk. I will try. I'm also trying to read here. Um, so they get there, and Joseph recognized them. And, of course, they, they bowed down, and Joseph immediately recalls his dream. This mm-hmm. is the fulfillment, the, the dream that set everything off and why his brothers wanted to kill him, because they, he told him, you're going to bow down to me. Right. And so they're here, and this is, this is becoming... A, a reality. And um, Joseph, this is where he begins this whole thing of intrigue where you kind of have to wonder what he's up to because he f- immediately accuses them of being spies. Mm-hmm. I, there, there's no, oh, hey, you know, I, I get the fact they were trying to kill him, but he doesn't throw them in prison. He doesn't have them arrested. He, he uh, well, he does, but he, he doesn't do it on the grounds of you tried to kill me. He does it under this, your spies. Mm-hmm. And so there begins this real cat and mouth, um, mouse game that's going on. And he begins to interrogate them. And they're like, you know, we're honest men. We're here and um, to get food and our father's home and he needs to be fed. Uh, our younger brother's at home. And they begin filling in kind of the blanks. And it, they almost seem to be adding information that Joseph didn't ask for. Right. and so. A lot of times when people do that, you definitely know they're nervous. Right. And you, you kind of... Well, I'd be nervous, too, if I'd been arrested. Uh, and, you know, under tre- uh, charges of espionage, basically. And, and it, it, it would make sense, though. I mean, if you're going to... There's, there's probably... Okay, so you're in the midst of a famine. Right. Who's got food? Mm-hmm. Egypt has food. And so it would make sense for another nation to, to go... Well, we need to go where there's food and get it. Mm-hmm. So you got to imagine that the the grain's probably well guarded, and paranoia is probably running a little bit high. If people are willing to travel to another country just to get food, they probably know the state of the world that every that no one else has food. And, and this would, shouldn't be too hard for us to to envision. I mean, we've got enough post apocalyptic movies and TV shows out there where people are fighting over food, and it probably wouldn't have been too far off from that. Right. And because we know that when there was a famine in the land, things got drastic. I mean, there's stories of cannibalism and things mm-hmm. because there wasn't the way, I mean, 
if you're a nomadic community, yeah, you, you save some food over, but not a whole lot. You aren't carrying around a winter supply of grain right. with your camel because you didn't, you didn't harvest a winter supply of grain because right. um, you didn't plant anything. So that's, they're very dependent on the other cultures that are doing these sorts of things and having mm-hmm. the, the um, produce of their flocks. So he does put them in the guardhouse. He keeps them there for three days. This is the, the same word um, that was used when Joseph was imprisoned. So he's given them a little taste of what he went through. Mm-hmm. And on the third day, he goes to them, which, you know, that, that number three there, it, it keeps popping up. Mm-hmm. And if we'll notice, three always gets used in uh, relationship to Joseph and things he's doing. When we're doing, dealing specifically with the Egyptians, our number is going to be five. And okay. so um, there, there's some significance to that, that I'm sure if I took time to take that all apart, we would be here for days. But so Joseph says, do this and you shall live for I'm a God fearing man. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers be held in the place of detention while the rest of you go and take rations to your starving household. So they have this discussion and Reuben speaks up and Reuben says, did I not tell you, do no wrong to the boy, but you paid no heed? Now comes, his reckon- now comes the reckoning for his blood. Okay. Reuben was the one that said, put him in the pit. Mm-hmm. He doesn't say, you know, stop what you're doing. This is wrong. He tries to do this little half measure. Right. It's like he, he wants to stop what's going on, but he doesn't want to really confront his brothers about what they're doing right but in hindsight you know hey i'm a great guy i told you to do the right thing forget the part where i said put him in the pit and we lost him Mm -hmm. we're just going to talk about the fact i said don't kill him right and so sounds very much like his uncle laban uh, or his grandfather laban right um so but joseph this is the first time he gets a clue that the brothers may not have all been in agreement that maybe they all didn't want him dead. Right. And they're saying this in front of him, and he, they don't know that, that he can understand them. Right. And so Joseph decides at this point that he's going to take Simon, and he's going to keep Simon as ransom. Mm-hmm. Now, Simon would have been the next one in birth order, and so that kind of makes sense that Simon's the one he, he takes. And, but also, um, Simon's kind of the one that is known for ha- being an aggressive man because I mean we were, the events at Shechem. Mm-hmm. So Simon could have played a pretty good role in trying to, you know, take Joseph out. Right. So we kind of have a little bit of doubt cast on him because of his past um, behaviors. It is interesting to note that this is the first time that the characters of the Bible are really having to deal with the effects of Babel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah this is the first time we have an interpreter that's going to, to speak on the behalf of another. Before okay. this, everyone seems to f- speak something that can be understood, at least somewhat. You know, there, there's, communication is open. So this, which actually kind of leads me back to uh, just a point we you, you mentioned briefly is like mm-hmm. you don't we don't really know how much time there was between Joseph being sold mm-hmm. and him and his initial rise to power mm-hmm. at Potiphar's house, but it had to have been at least a decent amount of time because he had to learn the language. Mm-hmm. So uh, you yeah, know, I would of course I don't know I mean it's the immersion method so he probably learned pretty quick. Right. But, um, well, and even running Potiphar's house, he had to have certain linguistic skills and had to be able to, he would have been having to uh, do trades with the mm-hmm. people who brought in food and stuff. So, I mean, he either picked up language very fast or he was there for a while before he became second in command. Right, right. And, well, I'm sure he worked his way up through the ranks. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm guessing he probably wasn't just like, oh, you <laughs> right. are okay. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to put you in charge of everything, stranger. Um, so, yeah, there, but there's this, uh, this is the first time that we're actually seeing that the consequences of Babel do impact lives. And I, I think it's interesting it took this long. I mean, we're in chapter 42, mm-hmm. 
and Babel was chapter 11. Right. And so we've had at least, well, we've had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and this is the fourth generation. Yeah. So this is a pretty good um, expanse of time. And so he sends the brothers home, minus Simon, and they go home with their food, but he puts all the money back in their bags. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay. Now, presumably a second in charge of, of Egypt, he had the authority to do this. Mm-hmm. But still, I, I, it throws the, the brothers off. It's a very weird thing to do to someone. Yeah. It's the, uh, it, it's, this is all very psychological. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing. It, it's really, it really is kind of funny. It's like, cause I mean, can you imagine like, I, I could have sworn I gave that to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, when they have talking... a receipt, you know, no. <laughs> well, yeah. Cause how, how, what happens if they have to go back to Egypt? And we're presuming that they're going to go back to Egypt at this point because Simon's there. Right. Yeah, and they left some collateral. Precisely. And they're going to have to face Joseph knowing that they didn't actually pay for what they took. Uh, and they get home and they, they, they try to explain the whole situation um, to Jacob. And when they see the money in the bags, they were dismayed. And their father, Jacob, said to them, it is always me that you bereave. Joseph is no more and Simon is no more. And now you want to take away Ch- uh, Benjamin. These things always happen to me. Right. And that, I mean, that's how, literally how the JPS has it. What, verse 36, how is the ESV? Of which chapter again? Uh, 42. 42. 36. Uh, da, 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 da. Your father, Jacob. You, you, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simon is more, no more. Now you take Benjamin. All this has come against me. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, like, but the JPS actually says, why do these things happen to me? It always it is always me that you bereave. Always me. The, these things always happen to me is the final line. So uh, I, it's, that's funny. It's very modern sounding to interpretation. It's very modern sounding, but it's also... It's, it's very honest sounding, like as far as his expression. Yeah. Well, and also sounds a lot like Rebecca. Mm-hmm. What, I can't live if these Hittite women and yeah. why is this happening to me? And I think it's funny how you can actually see the, the influence of the parents and the kids through the writing and the way that they talk and the way that they, they present themselves. Mm-hmm. And honestly, seeing some of that really is just a matter of reading the text over and over again until you get a feel for these characters. Well, and, and I, like, I like hearing it from the JPS translation because it sounds less formal because we, mm-hmm. do, we do kind of have, especially those of us who started out reading kjv uh-huh. everything sounds incredibly formal in the bible yes um it's like everyone you know someone's mad and it sounds like they're just writing a strongly worded letter to a supervisor <laughs> right. you know it's not like they're actually upset about anything yeah and again that difference in culture from even from the time at 1611 when the king james was written to today that difference in, in culture there. So mm-hmm. then going back from there to this time, you know, t- 2000 BCE or so, this is, it's a huge shift in, in dynamics. Right. So, um, but this is the first hint that we have that Jacob's kind of might have a clue that his sons may have killed their brother. Uh, there's kind of an indication that, you know, why are you doing this to me? You do, you are the ones who bereaved me. Mm-hmm. Uh, of first Joseph, now Simon, and you want to take away Benjamin. And so we never get that clarified, whether J- Jacob really knows whether or not his kids have a hand in it, mm-hmm. or if he just has maybe some suspicion. Or and we, It's really not clarified that he has suspicion, but I think this kind of lends itself to that understanding, that mm-hmm. this verse, the way he says it. Yeah, so Th- that they were the ones who brought the trouble. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's these these sons that everybody um everybody wants. And I I love um there's no thought about Simon really other than to say he's gone. There he's not like, okay, you guys got to go back and and show Benjamin to this guy. Straighten it out. Go get Simon, bring him home. It's no, he's dead. Just like Joseph's dead. Yeah, he's just, just let him go. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, um, you know, if he had the, to pay, face the possibility that Benjamin might be hurt, he's not even willing to, to entertain the idea. And mm-hmm. I, Jacob really, I mean, this is beyond just giving a nice coat to your favorite child. When Jacob had a favorite, he had a favorite. Right. And I think this kind of gives us a little more insight into why the brothers were so furious with, jo- with Joseph. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because. I was thinking, Jacob, like, you can't even go by grain without <laughs> screwing something up. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And he he really is. He's very dramatic. Um, it's so much like Rebecca. So Reuben responds. And this is this is fun. Uh, he, Reuben said to his father, you may kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my care and I will return him to you. Hmm. Reuben almost gets it. He almost, you can kill my two sons. Yeah. My, my sons. And he, this is Reuben. I mean, it's like, I want to make this grandiose gesture, but I'm going to stop right before it actually affects, affects me. me. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. And, so always, always someone else. Yeah. It's like that idea of if, you, if you're throwing someone else under the bus, then you're not actually yeah, being even loving. If, even his two kids, he's willing to, to sacrifice his two sons. But he's not willing to put himself on the line. Hmm. And so we're moving into chapter four. Well, let me read Jacob's response because Jacob says, My son must not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he alone is left. If he meets with disaster on the journey, you are t- uh, then the journey you are taking, you will send my white head down to Sheol in grief. Forget it. Simon's out of luck. And I don't trust you to get it done. It's not happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jacob has no faith in Reuben whatsoever right and then when we move into 43 uh but the famine in the land was severe and there's kind of this idea that we're getting an indication some time has passed Mm -hmm. and we don't know we don't know how long simon's been in egypt how long has he been (laughs) sitting in (laughs) yeah i never thought about simon actually when this story until you mentioned that just now because he's got to be going well any day now they should be guys (laughs) And, and wait a minute these are the brothers that did let Joseph get sold into slavery. So are they really, do they mm-hmm. care enough? All of this has to be happening. And, yeah. But we don't talk about Simon and we don't talk about all the, the psychology that's going in. Not that we want to psychologize the text too much, but at the same time, trying to put yourself in it so that you can, what would have been like, I mean, this family is so messed up. So, um, Chapter 43, verse 1, but the famine was severe, the famine in the land was severe, and when they had eaten up the rations they brought from Egypt, their father said, go again and procure some food for us. But Judah said to him, the man warned us, do not let us see your face unless your brother is with you. If you will let our brother go with us, we will go down and procure food for you, but you will not let him go, we will not go down. For the man said to us, do not let let me see your faces unless your brother is with you. So Judah's like, look, dad. This is what needs to be done. Yeah. If you, if you want to live, you'll trust me with, mm-hmm. with Benjamin. Yeah. And he, he really just, he, he lays it on the line. This is how it's going to happen. This is what, you know. And I think every parent, we watched our parents go through it with their parents. Um, every child has that moment with their parent where they have to go, look, this is how things are going to be. Right. And, uh, you know, our dad, when he got sick, that was some of the things we had to, dad, these are things that have to be done. Mm-hmm. And Judah really steps into the place where he takes that position of leadership. Cause that's the last time we hear from Reuben. Mm-hmm. Reuben doesn't speak anymore. He just, he's mentioned again in the blessing, but we really don't hear about him yeah, except for in the list of the patriarchs. He's just kind of in the background from here out. Yeah. I mean, Cause he never gets it right. So, but listen to Judah. He says, send the boy in my care and let us be on our way. We may not, we may live and not die at that. We may live and not die. You and we and our children, I myself will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible. If I do not bring him back and set him before you, I shall stand guilty before you forever. For we could have been there and back twice if we had not dawdled. <laughs> uh, I love that. But I could have been there and back by now. <laughs> And he's, but he's saying, I'll take the place. Right. Not, not my sons, not anyone else. 
I'm going to stand guilty before you. You get to decide my fate. And I'm going to take that risk and I'm not going to pawn it off on someone else. Right. And between the fact that, that he was able to stand up and say Tamar was more righteous than him mm -hmm. and to repent and to repent to a woman. And then this, where he's able to stand up and say, this is what needs to be done. I'm going to take responsibility. This is the first man who's been able to do any of those things. Right. So it makes sense that this is why the Messiah is the Lion of Judah. Yeah. And I, I think we need to, that, that kind of integrity, I don't think we talk about it enough in Christian circles. No, no. We, we, we talk about it, but we don't actually look at it from a human standpoint, I don't think. And the fact that it, it does take that kind of risk. Mm -hmm. at times whenever you know we just we have to now i do have to say okay so uh the pastor at the church that mickey and i have been attending we, he's been talking he's talking about integrity mm -hmm. and he was talking about like just different statistics and i don't remember all of them of just people who were surveyed about like what they would do for certain amounts of money and there was there was a you know i, I forget what percentage of people said they would they would uh sell their kids for 10 million dollars and he's like, now I understand some days. And I, I leaned over to Mickey and I said, did you happen to get his card? Like, <laughs> is that a recurring special or is that a one-time deal? Uh, but I'm, I'm kidding. We, but yeah, I mean, no, I, and that's, that's the thing. We'd we, had a particularly hard route to church that morning. <laughs> I think it's a Sunday morning necessity that you have to yell and scream at the kids in the car a couple of times. Well, I, I think it drives you to repentance a little bit. <laughs> kids help make you a little holier. You're definitely doing penance. But, you know, the, the thing is, when we don't look at issues like just in our day-to-day -day life, how do I deal with them with integrity? And we forget that every time we make a choice with integrity, we're actually living out our faith. Mm -hmm. And we, we are saying that you can... that. We can trust ourselves, not that somebody else can even trust us, but we can trust ourselves to actually be true to what we believe. Mm -hmm. and, and that's hard. I mean, if you really want to get down to it, you, the, the nitty gritty things that we're so easy, it's so easy to cut corners on mm -hmm. and society's okay with it. If, as long, society doesn't care what you do as long as you don't make a big scene about it. Right. And, you know, keep it off Facebook and nobody's going to say anything. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, but. But no, I, I do like what you're saying, though, that that the idea that Judah goes before his father mm -hmm. and says, I will make this right. And that's where you start seeing that, you know, like like you said, that Christ had to that came through the line of Judah, because that's where we start seeing the repentance and the responsibility and taking that and on. And it's so. the, both of those in tandem. Mm -hmm. it, it's not just a pity party of oh, I'm such a horrible person, look at me. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we confuse that as Christians as being some kind of righteous act when we put our, our brokenness on display. And, but then we never knew, move forward. I mean, Jake, uh, Judah acknowledged where he messed up, but then he moved forward. Right. And so, you know, should there be a moment of brokenness? Yes, but then we serve a God who heals and redeems mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. empower us. And so, and Judah is very much the one who is driving the family forward, literally, in this sense. Right. And, but what I do love about this, he doesn't just dismiss Jacob, because even though he's just told Jacob, okay, here's what we need to do, and kind of slaps him and snaps him out of it, mm -hmm. then Jacob uh, said to them, if it must be so, verse 11, if it must be so, do this, take some of the choice products of the land in your baggage, carry them down as a gift for this man. Some balm, some honey, gum, uh, a word I don't know, pistachio nuts, and almonds. These are the same things that um, the traders, the, the slave traders who bought Joseph mm -hmm. were carrying in, in their packs. And so that's why they were in the land to begin with. But now Jacob's going to send his sons carrying these back. But we're also taken back to that moment when Jacob is having to restore that relationship with Esau. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We send we send we gifts. send gifts. So this is a very Jacob move, and Reuben not Reuben, sorry, Judah allows himself to be guided by his father's wisdom. And yeah, I, I I like that because yes, there is a time to you know step up and say hey, you're making a mistake, but you don't discount the person in totality. Sure, 
And Jacob knew how to repair relationships. And he'd already proven that. Right. So. No, that's interesting. I, I love that. That's a great picture, too. I mean, it's, it's just that the redemptive thing. The, the whole story is just amazing. Um, so anyway, they take, he also tells them to take back double the money and um, that were in the bags. And he says, perhaps it was a mistake. I, I do like the fact that Jacob doesn't immediately jump to this conspiracy idea. Right. Uh, that one of the things that drives me crazy is when there's, <laughs> okay, yeah, soapbox warning. It, when something happens that might be inconvenient or might even be wrong for a person um, to automatically assume that it was a malicious act against them. I, I Somebody cut you off in traffic. It, I've been with people driving and somebody will cut them off in traffic and you will think that that other person got in their car three days ago, drove across country, found that person and deliberately cut them off in right. Tra- traffic. Right, yeah. Uh, okay, most of the time you aren't that important. Um, you know, most of the time it is an accident. It is a mistake. And, and I love the fact that Jacob gives that little bit of grace that mm-hmm. it, maybe it's a mistake. And, you know, maybe if we do the right thing, then it, it can be forgiven. Yeah, I actually, I, I took a defensive driving course a few years ago because I got a discount on my insurance. I need to take it again and get my <laughs> discount back. But um, it was actually, it was kind of interesting because the, it was, it was, led by a highway patrol officer and mm-hmm. he did a fantastic job. I really I, like he was, he was engaging. Like it was a great class. Um, but one of the things that he mentioned was, you know, we, we need to give people grace. He goes, because most, the, most of the time people don't want to cut anyone off. And he goes, and quite honestly, most of the people I've seen get cut off. It, they weren't actually cut off. They just were not paying attention to the other car that was about to go in front mm, of them. That's a good point. And so, that was, I'm sorry, that's, that's my traffic tip. Just pay attention. Look at the road around you. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's totally unrelated, but just pay attention. Because some, sometimes if you're just anticipating where the cars are going to go watching, then you, like, I almost never get cut off because yeah. I'm, I'm always watching the road now. And I, I'm not saying I'm flawless, but, mm-hmm. and, there, and there's been times where I've done some stupid things where something's happened and I've reacted wrong. It, that's where I, I wish I had like mistakes. a sorry sign to like. <laughs> yeah, I know. And. Um, but yeah, it definitely helps. And of course, and a lot of that, a lot of the way I drive too, was just like from training. Cause I used to work in the heavy haul industry. So I, I drive differently than most people do. Yeah, you definitely. And, but okay. I'm not going to go off on that. <laughs> tangent. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. So, um, so anyway, he sends him back with the gifts and with the, double the money. He's still head of the house. He's, he's still guiding them, even though Ruben did step up and kind of, uh, push them in the right direction. And so they go to Egypt and they take Benjamin with them. And when Benjamin saw them, he just, um, he immediately orders his servants, prepare the food. Uh, I want them to come to my house to eat. Now, mm-hmm. at this point, you've got to imagine nerves are going crazy because yeah. he's not explaining anything. It's like last time they put us in prison. <laughs> now we're going to his house. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) well, and the text specifically says in verse 18, but the men were frightened at being brought into Joseph's house. And it says it must be, they thought that the money replaced in our bags the first time that we have been brought inside as a pretext to attack us and seize us as slaves with our pack animals. And so they set up to Joseph's, uh, went up to Joseph's house, uh, Stuart, and spoke to him in the entrance of the house. And uh, it says, if you, Lord, um, if you please, and they explain that they're there to to get food. They just want to, you know, they'll just make a camp for the night. It's cool. But we're going to we're going to tell you, hey, by the way, the money was in our bags mm-hmm. and uh, you need to know this so that we don't have any problems here. I, I, I just right. I have this whole image of my mind of yeah let's clear the air before we go in <laughs> yeah it's almost you know the gangster movies where they're trying to oh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah very much and so uh he replies all is well do not be afraid your god the god of your father must have put the treasure in the bags for you i got your payment right and so again this there's this psychological game going on and then he brought simon out to him and he, he has the men of the house bathe their feet. And he, um, when they laid the gifts out for um, Joseph, and they, they, 
he, you know, he, there, there's this hospitality that's being extended both ways. Everyone's being very formal. Yeah, and and, uh, and so here's an interesting. I I mean, if you're if you and I may be getting ahead of you, okay. but it's an it's a really interesting picture overall of the gospel story, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have you have the brothers; they have a need, mm-hmm. so they go where the the need can be met. And they try to pay for it, but they can't pay for it. They're not allowed to pay for it, but they're still blessed, right? Right. But whenever what they went, whenever what they paid for ran out, they go back and they, but they expect because they realize that they have committed a criminal act basically. Mm -hmm. And so then when they go back begging, they're not put in prison this time. When they go back trying to purchase something by their own ways, they're put in prison. Right. And when they go back having to act on faith and 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 beg for mercy they're taken to the to the house of the second uh, of in the second in command i mean who you know who for all intents and purposes is basically operating as the ruler of egypt so they're mm-hmm. basically taken to the king's house and so it's a very interesting dichotomy and in this gospel picture well, that whenever we go to god not expecting to go by our own merit that when we ask say we go saying I don't deserve whatever it is you're going to get here. Here's what happened. We stole the the We're, treasure again, and we honesty. want to return. We, we want to return the treasure that's yours and, and, and just confessing and knowing that even if you return the treasure by all rights, you could be killed. Mm-hmm. And, and so when, when you go in that way in faith, when you don't have a guarantee that what you have is going to be good enough, mm-hmm. then you get taken to the king's house. So, I, so well, I thought that was kind of a cool. No, it is parallel. And, okay. uh, parallel. <laughs> now let's take it one step further. And not only do you go to the king's house expecting all kinds of bad repercussions and yet being invited to eat, mm-hmm. then you find out the king's your brother. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. <laughs> it's it, it really is. It, it 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 plays through the gospel, and it, I this is what I love about it. God in His sovereignty allows humanity to to take these crazy side trails and make all these foolish decisions mm-hmm. and yet he still weaves it together to create this picture where we are so much in the image of him we're going to end up imaging him yeah you know yeah, i love it's, it i love it <laughs> and so um they they sit down to eat and joseph begins to um ask about their father and he introduces them to um, to Benjamin, and he he blesses Benjamin, and then he has to hurry out of the house, and he is uh, you know he's weeping because this is his brother, and this is his full brother, the mm-hmm. only one that that probably wasn't involved in well, selling. Well, he wasn't him. because he was with with Jacob. With Jacob, yeah, we don't have that specifically spelled out, but we do know. But we assume. We assume. And you know, and the age difference, right? Because uh, you know, Reuben was pretty well grown by the time um, Benjamin was born. Well, even Judah was grown because it says at that time, this is true. Judah went and found a wife. This is true. So. Yeah. So, um, so when Joseph has them seated, though, he has them seated in the order of their birth, mm-hmm. and. This is part of his game. I, 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 I'm not trying to be flippant, but he, his testing of them. He's setting them in the order of birth because they were born pretty close together. Mm-hmm. And we also don't know, like with Rachel and Leah and Bilha and Zilpa, the, the, yeah. where the overlaps were. We right. know the order for each woman, but where was that between the women? Right. So... To know the order, I mean, I have a hard time keeping my two kids straight. <laughs> so, you know, keeping 12 straight, that's going to be pretty impressive. And so they're already starting to question, how, how does he know? Right. The, the, it's starting to, to cause some concern. And he sets them, um, Joseph eats by himself. The Egyptians eat with, their, uh, with the Egyptians. And then um, the brothers eat by themselves. And we don't know really uh, why. We've got some hints. Uh, we know that it's, there, it's abhorrent to the Egyptians. But 
the more I've dug into that, because I was digging into it um, in preparation for this episode, and the traditional understanding is because they're shepherds, mm -hmm. and that is brought up later and specific, specified that shepherds are abhorrent to the Egyptians, that because sheep and goats are sacred animals, that they don't eat sheep and goats, and of course the Hebrew people definitely do. Right. Um, there's some debate on that because we do know from archaeology that some Egyptians did eat sheep and goats. Uh, but one of the things that could have happened is, you know, a lot of the religious taboos and um, observances were often more closely observed by the, the elite, mm -hmm. the leadership and the rich people right, who had right. enough money to, where if you're poor and you're hungry, you're going to eat what's available. You're going to eat what's available. Which actually would feed into classism and the, mm -hmm. you know. Which is very much a part of Egyptian society. And that's, and the other the thing. The ancient Egyptian society, we don't know about now. Yeah, I haven't visited I, I have lately. Not, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Couldn't tell you about modern. We're not trying to insult anyone. Right. No, if anyone would like to finance uh, me doing a research trip. But no, <laughs> that's, uh, we'd love to check that out further. Um, but the other option too is, in Egypt, remember Joseph was given the linen clothes uh -huh. by, okay. So linen's a plant-based mm -hmm. uh, material. It, it doesn't hold color very well. So it, that's the reason why you always see it in the white or the yeah. off-white. Uh, not easy to dye. The, um, the Hebrew people wore woven goods. Yeah. And this was woven without a lot of processing. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of places to wash all the lanolin and they everything. They didn't have bleach. Exactly. And so every time it rained, it smelled like a wet sheep. Interesting. You know? And so, uh, so the, even the smell of the people would have been different due to the cultural differences. And well, due to the clothing, due primarily. To the, yeah. Well, well that, but the clothing was shaped by the cultural difference. Uh, yeah. The, the other thing, too, is there's just a general dis distrust. Uh, we see this all throughout history. When you have an established society, when then the gypsies or the hobos or the nomads come through, there, there's that, that, you know, those people aren't as good as us. Yeah. The, yeah. How, how, you know, can we trust them here uh, on Chocolat? The, the, I love that movie. Mm -hmm. um, Johnny Depp. All the gypsies down by the river. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but we still see that today, that transient cultures are not to be trusted. Right. And so, um, and I mean, think about how old Egypt was. I mean, that was an established right. society. Well, and it's kind of like, there's also, you didn't really, I mean, you would have some traders go in between, but usually those were people that was their lifestyle. But for someone who had an established life, why would, why do you go to another town? Yeah, well, and Egypt had closed borders for a long time. Yeah. They, they were very particular about who they let in and, and who they kept out. And so um, they, they do eat with him. And when they eat with him, he is having his servants fill the bags at this point. Right. And so he's getting ready to send them back with food. And he once again has the money put back right into the bags. Right. And this time he puts the silver goblet in Benjamin's bag. Uh-huh. And so... So, so he, he um, puts back the money, uh -huh. but then he puts something of his. Right. The silver goblet. Exactly. And that's where we get into trouble. So, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, this is exactly. And uh, as soon as they leave, he tells the servants, hey, get up, go after him, go catch them. And um, he... Uh, it says you ask them why do you repay good for with for evil? Uh, it is the very one from which my master. This is the steward talking uh, to the brothers. Uh, Joseph Stewart talking to the brothers. My master drinks uh, from this goblet and he uses it for divination. Mm -hmm. And why would you? Do, what a wicked thing for you to do! And the brothers and the, it doesn't specify which one. Uh, they said whichever one of your servants is found with it shall die. And the rest of us, moreover, the rest of us will be your servant. Yeah. Okay. So, number one, we're reminded of Jacob's declaration mm -hmm. to Laban. This is whoever is found with the idols, they're going to die. Mm -hmm. And then number two, 
the brothers notice we don't have a clarification which one spoke. It, it's attributed to all of them. The rest of us will be your service, your Excuse servant. Me. Yeah, we're we're taking collective responsibility, and in the Jewish culture, this collective responsibility and responsibility to the community is an important part of their culture that we as Americans just don't get. Right. And yeah, so, and this is, but the other big thing we're, we're moving away from this brother, that brother, half brother. Now we're all uniting. Yeah. And we're moving towards that family unit that we haven't had before. Right. And that's going to be huge. Oh, um, so they put down the bags, they go through the bags, they, they pull it out, um, the money, and nothing said about the money. But Interestingly enough, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not mentioned at all. But then when they get to Benjamin's bag, um, the, the goblet's there, and Joseph and his brothers reentered the house with, I mean, sorry, Judah and his brothers reentered the house with Joseph, and they threw themselves on the ground. And Joseph said to them, what is this deed you have done? Do you not know that a man like me practices divination? Um, yeah, so it's really not far-fetched that Joseph would practice divination. Right. Because he's Laban's grandson. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the word here is nakash. And that's that same word that Laban used that, don't you know that I, 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 I'm a nakash? Mm -hmm. I, I could find where you are because of this. And, of course, we talked about Nakash. Uh, that's the same word for the serpent in the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole idea is somebody who is using some means to acquire knowledge that God does not approve of. Right. And, and this, this um, goblet very well could have been used by Joseph for divination. Yeah. He, he would have known, and it, I mean, he's married to the priest of On's daughter mm -hmm. um, in Egypt. This kind of divination and practices were, were very common. They, it was not something that you shied away from. And we had the Egyptian magicians for Pharaoh in Exodus. And so I don't see any reason to think that he didn't use it for this. Right. Um, it, he's got a family history of it. And so, um, but Judah's response here is very interesting in that he says, what can we say my, to my Lord? How can we plead? How can we prove our innocence? God has, un, uncovered, God has uncovered the crime of your servants. Mm -hmm. What crime did they commit? Yeah, it's kind of like, kind of like it's gone as far as like gaslighting them into thinking they actually did something terrible. Well, that, or is Judah realizing that what they did to Joseph is the guilt that they've all carried around with them. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. Is he having because, this? Oh, because that's right. Because Joseph even says, God's put this money mm -hmm. in your bag. Your God the, did this. Yeah, your God did this. And then I guess it would be that this is, yeah, their divine retribution for what they did to Joseph. Because, uh, yeah, that makes sense. They, they said, I, I'll, be, I'll be your servants. I'll be your slaves. They're, they, they're going to go into the same situation that they allowed Joseph to be sold into. Yep. And they're, but they're willing to do it voluntarily in hopes of saving uh, Benjamin. So um, Judah, uh, um, Joseph says, you know, far be it for me to act like this. Only he is in possession of the goblet was, that was found will be my slave. The rest of you shall go back to peace. Go back in peace to your father. And, and Judah goes into this long speech, which we won't go into, other than to say, uh, number one, this is the longest speech in all of the Torah. Okay. And long speeches aren't particularly good things in the Bible in general. <laughs> uh, this is probably the main exception, because what Judah does, he, number one, he picks up on the thing that Joseph does not want to kill. He, he has no desire to take a life. And Judah wants to capitalize on that. And he really drives home that, that connection between Benjamin mm -hmm. and Jacob. The other thing he does is he quotes Jacob. And I think this is interesting because he says, um, 
he, he's saying, Jacob said this. Judah is saying, Jacob said this. As you know, my wife bore me two sons, but one is gone from me. Jacob, in his own speech, doesn't even acknowledge the other three wives. Yeah, the other three wives or their kids. And that includes Judah, who's right. doing the speaking. Judah doesn't care. He's turned loose of it. Yeah. He can recount this to Joseph and say, I still love my father, despite the fact that he's pretty much basically rejected me. Yeah. He, he's not even including me among his legitimate children. And I'm still going to defend his heart. Mm. I mean, this is why Judah is, he's the hero of the story. Yeah. Not Joseph. Joseph is manipulating. He, Joseph's being Jacob. Yeah. He's and, being kind of a jerk. Well, he's being Jacob. <laughs> he's also being Laban. I, I think really Joseph is who Jacob would have become if he'd stayed with Laban. Okay. And I, I that's my personal opinion. I don't know anyone else who says that. But Judah is the one who just says, I'm not going to let all of these circumstances shape me. Yeah. I, I'm going to do the right thing uh, no matter what it cost me. And even if that means I have to expose the fact my father doesn't even love me the way he should, it's still worth hmm. it if I can save my brother. And, you know, talk about the gospel story. Yeah. I mean, it's just no greater love have, has a man than those to who lay like, down his life yeah. for his brother. Yeah. So I just, it, when I studied the story from this perspective, I, I loved it so much more than when the spotlight was on Joseph. When Judah took center stage, it's like, now I have a hero I can get behind. Yeah, and but we, we do always talk about Joseph and what he did. Mm -hmm. And so, so at this point, we're still, Joseph hasn't revealed himself. Joseph has not revealed to himself. Him, to his brothers. Mm -hmm. So are we going yeah, to cover that on the next episode? Let's cover think? that on the next one, and we'll talk about what that means and get into... Uh, moving to Egypt and what it means to have the family in Egypt. Okay. Okay. Well, cool. I, I like that, man. That's a, that's <laughs> a crazy, crazy foreshadowing of what's happening in the story of, of mm -hmm. the gospel and the world in general. I mean, it's, and, 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 and I love it whenever we get to like really break down and show that, that kind of foreshadowing that's just going on in the text, because I mean, we, we talk a lot about how it all plays out, mm -hmm. but we often, we don't get those like this is the gospel, yeah. Um, and in the the ways that we're looking at it, and and again, this is where we we get to look at the story and say this is what we see in it. And again, this we may be putting our twenty first century lenses on it, but I really think that it's a, there's no way, no two ways about the fact that it's a story of redemption. It 100% is. And it, it's a story of God's sovereignty and his love and provision through all the blunder and bumbling. And I, I love that mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't think most of us don't need a God to save us from our perfection. Right. Most well, Jesus <laughs> says, you know, it's not the well that need a doctor, but the sick. Exactly. And so to see the, these people who will be remembered for all time as the father of Israel, and then the heroes of our faith, then that gives us hope. Mm -hmm. And so, and I always, I want to bring it back around to the fact that the Bible is a message of hope. And because yeah. so often it's, it's presented as a rule book of don't do this and don't do that. And it's talked about as an oppressive document and it's not, it, it's right. freedom. It, it, well, and, and how many people do you know who've gotten bad representations of the Bible who feel like they can't go to church anymore? Right. Because we do try to deify and clean up these people and they were just as messed up, probably more so mm -hmm. in some respects than we are today. Well, and you know, and I, I grew up in the church and I even wrestled with some of that when uh, I went through my divorce, you know, where's my place in the church. Mm -hmm. And because that's how we, we mess up showing God's love to each other. And I think all of us have got to learn how to walk that, that message of love and acceptance and forgiveness with the the idea that we're supposed to grow and mm -hmm. mature once that we've received that love, but not expecting someone to be mature before they get that love. Right. So we've got to get the process in, in the right order. Mm -hmm. And we don't always do a great job at that. Yeah. It's, we're, we're all, uh, you know, work in progress. So anyway, well, 
that's a great place to wrap up. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, be sure to, uh, like subscribe and share. Um, if you really like what you heard, Raven Creek SC, or no, patreon.com slash Raven Creek SC. If you want to support us, if you want to be part of the conversation, uh, anyone's welcome to do that on social media at Raven Creek SC. We can find us Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook or Raven Creek SC.com where you can directly comment on the, uh, <laughs> right on the, the page there you go on the blog. So, um, yeah, come, come back, be part of this. We enjoy doing it and we hope you enjoy listening. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes, or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening, and don't forget to join us next week.